Our topic this evening is the theology of Christmas. We try to have Christmas-themed ones when we're about to go on our Christmas break, and we've done some fun ones in the past, including uh, look at the theology or the Christmas story in the life of Brian and so on. So there is a, a Will Ferrell movie called uh, Talladega Nights, the Ballad of Ricky Bobby. It's not a great movie, I don't think. I think it's a funny movie, but it's not a great movie. But the scene in it uh, of Ricky Bobby and his family uh, saying grace, I think is really hilarious. So Will Ferrell plays a successful NASCAR race driver, part of a, um, he's a Southern American, not South American, he's a Southerner from the United States, Ricky Bobby, and he is saying a very extensive prayer on his family meal, which he describes as a bountiful harvest of Domino's, KFC, and the always delicious Taco Bell. During his invocation of God, Ricky Bobby prays to dear Lord, baby Jesus. And at one point he asks, we hope that you, you can use your baby Jesus powers to heal his father-in-law. So after he repeatedly invokes the dear Lord, tiny baby Jesus, his wife, Carly, interrupts the grace to say, hey, um, you know, sweetie, Jesus did grow up and you don't always have to call him baby. It's a bit odd and off putting to pray to a baby. But Ricky justifies his practice. He says, well, look, I like the Christmas Jesus best when I'm saying grace. When you say grace, you can say it to grown up Jesus or teenage Jesus or bearded Jesus or whoever you want. And he then doubles down on his version of Jesus' infancy. So he says, dear tiny Jesus in your golden fleece diapers with your tiny little fat balled up fists, <laughs> Dear eight pound, six ounce, newborn, infant Jesus, don't even know a word yet, just a little infant so cuddly, but still omnipotent. <laughs> we thank you for all your power and your grace, dear baby. God, amen. Um, you know, so he is a pretty funny scene, good satire. And uh, I don't know, his father-in-law at some point says, he was a man, he had a beard. <laughs> but you know, in other words, he likes to pray to the, the baby Jesus, the Christmas Jesus best. So while Talladega Nights is satire, this depiction of Jesus as an infant is actually quite traditional in Christianity. Um, so if you have had a um, nativity set like I had growing up, part of that, one of the major figures is, you know, a baby Jesus. And he is usually there lying in a manger and you have all of the other figurines, Joseph and Mary the animals, the shepherds, and the different wise men, and even the star. And that's usually what's traditional in a crash in a uh, traditional nativity scene. So I want to think about this um, idea of the theology of Christmas, of looking at um, uh, baby God who is helpless as a little God, a little baby, but also is still omnipotent. And um, the closest, I think, you know, this is incorporated into a lot of the carols that we sing at Christmas time. And I don't know, sometimes maybe we don't think about the words of hymns, especially traditional ones. We just know these words and we just sing them. And so I want to look at um, some of these, say, read some of these out loud. So I think that in terms of like a prayer to dear Lord, baby Jesus, um, away in the manger comes maybe the closest of those. And so I thought we might read that. So it goes away in a manger, no crib for a bed. The little Lord Jesus lay down his sweet head. The stars in the sky looked down where he lay. The little Lord Jesus asleep on the hay. The cattle are lowing, the poor baby wakes, but little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. I love thee, Lord Jesus. Look down from the sky and stay by my cradle till morning is nigh. So the hymn doesn't necessarily say, I love thee, little baby, Lord Jesus, look down to the sky. So it's not necessarily like Ricky Bobby praying to Lord Jesus, but it has been talking about the little Lord Jesus who doesn't cry. So um, one of the interesting things 
ideas I think that these lyrics bring is the idea, okay, so Jesus is fully human and divine, so if he is here as a baby in the Christmas story, in the Christmas song, would he cry as an infant? The uh, author here of Away in the Manger says, no, little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. Jesus' childhood is also envisioned in uh, the song Once in Royal David City. Um, and the middle verse is, I think this is actually all the verses. So, once in Royal David City stood a lowly cattle shed where a mother laid her baby in a manger for his bed. So, manger is just a word for um, food trough for animals, but it mostly only exists now, you know, in relation to Jesus. But mange, you know, is French for eat, right? And so it's a place for eating for animals. With a manger for his bed, Mary was that mother mild, Jesus Christ, her little child. He came down to earth from heaven, who is God and Lord of all. And his shelter was a stable, and his cradle was a stall. With the poor, the mean, and lowly lived on earth our Savior holy. And through all his wondrous childhood, he would honor and obey, love and watch the lowly maiden in whose gentle arms he lay. Christian children all must be mild, obedient, good as he. It's sort of an interesting <laughs> verse there. You know, throughout his wondrous childhood, he would honor and obey and do all these things. We don't actually... Um, uh, have a lot of examples of this in the canonical Gospels. Um, the only episode uh, we have of Jesus' wondrous childhood comes from the Gospel of Luke, where as a um, younger boy, um, he and his family have gone from Nazareth to Jerusalem for the Passover, and on the way back, uh, he's supposed to be with the caravan somewhere, but instead he has remained behind in Jerusalem uh, where he is hanging out in the temple, uh, talking to all of the, the scholars there, all of the rabbis. And um, that does not, being mild and obedient and thinking about uh, his mom's, <laughs> this lovely maiden and all of her concerns, she is described as being very worried and nervous when she finds out he's not there and they have to run back to Jerusalem. Uh, and he's surprised that they don't know where he would be. He's in his father's house, as he says. And so um, it's interesting, an interpretation here that isn't um, built off of any scripture, but is instead what the author um, is thinking, that a, a young God, Jesus, as a little boy, would be acting like. And, by the way, holding him up as a model for all Christian children must be obedient mild and good as he. For he is our childhood's pattern. He's a model for us. Day by day, like us, he grew. He was little, weak, and helpless. Tears and smiles like us he knew. And he feeleth for our sadness, and he shareth in our gladness. So, unlike the little Lord Jesus who did not cry, in John Thomas McFarland's Away in a Manger, um, author Cecil Francis Alexander hears, um, or Cecil Francis Alexander, I don't know exactly how to pronounce that one. <laughs> so, so I think it's, it's a Francis is a woman, so maybe it's Cecile. Cecile is what it should be. Uh, wrote once in Royal David City, a fully human Jesus here um, knows both sadness and tears. He's described as little weak and helpless, uh, despite being God. So we have that kind of description. Um, nevertheless, I think most of the traditional carol, carols focus instead not on uh, Jesus' human qualities, but on the idea of worshiping the newborn king, as, for example, in Hark the Herald Angels Sing, which reads, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, Glory to the Newborn King. <laughs> 
Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies. With angelic hosts proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. The third verse of Hark, the herald angels sing, brings in Christian soteriology. So that's the study of the idea of salvation, the idea of Christ as a savior, and in this case, the idea of bringing salvation in the form of new life, such can birth, resurrection. So this verse reads, Hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace, Hail the Son of Righteousness, light and life to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. Mild he lays his glory by, born that man no more may die, born to raise the sons of earth, born to resurrect people, born to give them second birth. So man no more may die, the defeat of death, uh, the raising and resurrection of humankind. Meanwhile, the second verse of Hark the Herald Angel Sings mixes in some of the heavier Christology, just like what is, how does Christ fit into deity? Some of the idea of Christ incarnate, um, the idea of Godhead veiled in flesh, of God pleased to live with man as man. So we read in this verse, Christ by highest heaven adored, Christ the everlasting Lord. Late in time behold him come, offspring of a virgin's womb, veiled in flesh the Godhead see. So you can see now the Godhead, you can see God here veiled in flesh. Hail the incarnate deity. Pleased as man with man to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. And Emmanuel is a theophoric name, meaning in Hebrew, El with us, God with us. So it's a lot of um, verses there about incarnation. So um, another thing that Christmas carols tend to do is prefigure Jesus' death you know, at the time of his birth. So since the sacred story of Christ ends with Easter, with the crucifixion and the resurrection, many Christmas carols prefigure that ending as, for example, in the final verses of one of my favorites, We Three Kings of Orient Are. So after the first two kings, they have the whole three kings verses and, you know, they have the original the introductory verse, and then the first two kings offer gold and then frankincense. Now in the fourth verse, the third king offers myrrh, and myrrh is an ointment that was used anciently to prepare bodies for funerals. So that verse reads, myrrh is mine, its bitter perfume breathes a life of gathering gloom, sorrowing, sighing, bleeding, dying, sealed in the stone-cold tomb. So here's a baby born to die. Uh, there is a gathering gloom as we are moving towards the tomb. So then the final verse, glorious now, behold him arise, king and God and sacrifice. Alleluia, alleluia, sounds through the earth and skies. So this is kind of adding into it an atonement theory. So Jesus is born here king and God and sacrifice. So this is why an atonement theory, an answer, an attempt to answer the question, why does Jesus need to have, a, have to die? Why did Jesus need to die? And uh, We Three Kings anyway is offering the idea of a, um, a sacrificial um, theory. So sometimes maybe that's like a substitution or a um, re uh, redemption theory of atonement. There's many different ways that Christians understand atonement, but this is one of them, that he is, a, um, he is himself serving as the sacrifice the way um, uh, all of the previous um, blood sacrifices that happened in Old Testament or Mosaic law. So the sense from week three kings 
um, though, draws directly from the source material. So the whole reason why the Gospel of Matthew's story about the Magi, so the gifts that the wise men from the East bring, you know, gold and frankincense, myrrh is actually on that list symbolically because the author of Matthew is um, explicitly meaning to prefigure Jesus' death at his birth. That's what, how, how we are supposed to read the story, and uh, it's made explicit in this carol. All right, so those carols sort of, I think, give us a little bit of a grounding about how um, Christians continue to sing about uh, their theology of Christmas at Christmas seasons. Um, I want to maybe now put that into a little bit of a um, historical context and a developmental context. Um, one of the things that we have when we're looking at something, an edifice like Christmas that is um, uh, built up in so much tradition, as a foundation of layer after layer of tradition, um, it's sometimes very unclear where any of the ideas all came because they are all um, intertwined with each other. So although the Christmas stories come first, in chronological order, if we're telling the life story of Jesus, um, obviously he's born and that's the beginning of the, of the story. Nevertheless, the, the details of this, um, they're among the last additions to the movement's development in the first century. So the two Christmas stories that we have are found in the Gospel of Matthew, which was written probably in the 80s, and Luke, written maybe in the 90s of the first century. And as we know, the earlier Gospel, the first narrative Gospel, Mark, written around the year 70, lacks any um, such story. It just begins with the um, story of Jesus as a 30-year-old or so being baptized by John the Baptist. And so we've had many, many lectures where we um, talk about then the authors of Matthew and Luke who are using um, Mark as the source for much of their narrative. Uh, and then they're also using an unknown source, probably a hypothetical source, according to the most um, under, widely understood uh, scholarly answer to the synoptic question. They're also using an unknown lost hypothetical source called Q, for Kvela, the, saying, the lost saying source. Um, but then they are making up or, or their own stuff, or they are using their own material from their own communities, the Mathean material and Lucan material. So... Childhood stories are actually very rare in antiquity. So it isn't unusual that when writing a narrative, uh, the author of Mark um, just starts where Jesus starts doing something important. So he starts during that baptism, which takes place shortly before Jesus begins his own ministry as a, uh, a teacher and as a healer, a person who is proclaiming the good news and who is gathering disciples around him. That's where the story starts. Um, childhood was rarely a focus for ancient authors. On the one hand, they lacked um, the modern biographical framework that we have. So we understand our adult life as resulting from let's say, influences and choices that we made in childhood. So you look back at some teacher in third grade who taught you some lesson and that has had an effect, or you did um, some activity and that caused you to um, learn a life lesson and you see that as informing who you are as an adult. That absolutely is not how ancient authors understood um, development. So for them, the person fully formed, they are always the person they were meant to be. And when they create stories of childhood, they only use those to show um, that that person's character was already apparent at that, that early age. So childhood stories are created as a way to prefigure uh, the adult that the infant or the child was destined or fated to eventually become, as far as the ancient author is understood. 
And so in that sense, the, it's not ancient, but the early modern biography of George Washington, um, where the biographer created this very famous uh, myth uh, of George Washington chopping down the cherry tree, but then despite that being sort of a childhood act of you know, vandalism, he nevertheless has so much integrity that he says, I cannot tell a lie. That's showing the integrity that Washington eventually has. So this is a fun painting of this by Grant Wood, the same painter who painted the American Gothic. It's called Parson Weems' Fable, so referring to Mason Locke Weems, um, the biographer of George Washington who uh, created the I Cannot Tell a Lie, I Did It With My Little Hatchet story, um, showing George Washington's incredible integrity as a child, even though, um, again, this is a well-known myth. One thing I also like about this painting is that it also has George Washington with his adult head. <laughs> and that is often how ancient people portray um, uh, children, because again, they're not as paying as much attention to what kids actually look like, and they're also thinking about them as, you know, Jesus as the little person that he's eventually prefigured that he's going to be. And so sometimes it's almost like Mary is holding a, um, a little adult Jesus, although not usually with, with the beard. But um, in the same way, when we see pictures um, of Mary's um, as a baby being held by her mom, uh, uh, St. Anne, she often is just a little tiny Mary, you know, again, full adult Mary, seemingly, uh, in that as a convention. All right. So um, just then by way of this kind of background, as we have seen, um, the development um, of Christianity is um, not an immediate thing. It's not that Jesus founds a church and has those church uh, people all uh, known as Christians. Even the um, New Testament account uh, suggests that the word Christian didn't get attached to the movement until much later, once Paul is involved and once uh, it's, it's, a, it's a name that it gets attached to the community in the, in the Greek city of Antioch, um, Greek Syrian city of Antioch, the capital of Roman Syria, um, much later. Instead, we have um, this initial movement that has more than one leader, people like John the Baptist, Jesus, and also Jesus' brother, James, who are focusing on um, probably eliminating uh, concern for property, so renouncing uh, property and renouncing kind of worldly concerns, and instead, uh, focusing on spiritual matters and inclusion, so um, uh, creating kind of a spiritual community that you might be akin to what uh, you might think of a group of Buddhist monks or Franciscan friars, people who are doing good in the community, who are spending their time in prayer, who are mendicants, who are uh, begging for their daily bread, um, and that uh, and who are saying essentially, blessed are the poor, uh, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Uh, and so the poor of Jerusalem may be like the early, an early name for this group. Out of this group, this group which is initially a sect of Judaism, as people like Paul uh, convert and who start spreading um, uh, a gospel, I'm sorry, after Jesus' uh, execution, several of these, uh, his disciples have visions of him, uh, the ri risen, and, and affirm their testimony that uh, Jesus has been resurrected and is now sitting at the right hand of God as God's Messiah. Um, that leads to the conversion of people like Paul, who then spread that as good news, and the Christian community then starts growing throughout the Greek-speaking uh, cities of the Roman Empire, those communities of mixed Greek and Jewish converts um, eventually diverge enough from the rest of Judaism um, that there is a schism between 
the rest of Second Temple Judaism and them, and the Christians are expelled from synagogues. And it's around that time that we start having then our earliest sources, sources like Q and Mark, Matthew and Luke, and also then John, um, sources that are uh, um, after Crip, Paul, of course, being the earliest. These are sources that are all written in Greek. And so there's already been that transformation that has happened in this early community. So this is just by way of background as this is all developing. And so in the initial stages of this, throughout you can even just see that beginning movement, Jesus' teachings are not about his childhood or his infancy or that sort of thing. He is teaching um, you know, things like the, the Sermon on the Mount, the different Beatitudes, and so forth. Um, Paul is has teachings where he's specifically focusing on the good news uh, of the defeat of death, that Christ is risen, and that everyone can achieve new life in that. Even when we get to Mark there in 70, there is no focus on a nativity gospel in there, and it's only then at the end of this century with Matthew and Luke that we're going to get these Christmas stories. So I just want to show that this is not at the beginning of the Christian experience. So as we've seen in earlier lectures, proto-Christianity, so it's not even called Christianity at first, Jesus was probably, like I say, that leader of a mendicant movement focused on practicing spiritual poverty. And after his crucifixion, many of his disciples reported visions of him risen. That's what led some of them to conclude that he is the Messiah. So this becomes Paul's central theme. And of course, Paul is the first Christian whose writings survive. Paul never met the historical Jesus. But due to that spiritual experience, he testifies that he had seen uh, the risen Christ. So nevertheless, the idea that Christ is Lord... So we've talked about that, uh, this idea that exists in the Old Testament already, this idea that is already in Second Temple Judaism and the writings of Jews like Philo of Alexandria, that whereas the God is unseen and unknowable, you can experience God's glory. You can ex experience God's word. You can see that through creation. And um, um, the idea for... Paul is that Jesus, that Christ is that Lord, that Christ is that word. In other words, that this is um, uh, God's glory made incarnate. So um, that's what's important to Paul. So Paul isn't even really, unlike the earlier um, people in the movement, including uh, the ongoing movement led by Jesus' brother, James, back in Jerusalem, um, Jesus' teachings aren't really the central idea for Paul. It's this Christ event uh, is what's important to Paul. So be that as it may, whether or not particular details were of importance to Paul, what's important to the people who follow after him is this testimony that Christ brought, uh, that Christ is the Messiah, I'm sorry, that Jesus is the Messiah, by doing that, by, by making that testimony, that brings an inheritance. So for centuries, there has already been a very large and developing messianic tradition within Second Temple Judaism. And so this tradition um, consists, for example, of passages in the Hebrew Bible that are already being interpreted or reinterpreted messianically. And so those are things that regular Second Temple Jews, including ones that did not end up becoming Christian, um, but they might have interpreted it as they are looking for their, forward to their own understanding of the Messiah and how the Messiah will come, who the Messiah will be. And we've even seen, uh, when we did our lecture on the Bar Kokhba re revolt, um, that many of the uh, Jews, including a lot of the early rabbis who did not become Christian, uh, saw in Bar Kokhba the idea uh, that he was a messiah and they were going to have a political uh, messianic uh, 
um, revolution. And uh, one of the reasons why he has that name Bar Kokhba, I mean, son of a star, is another one of these messianic um, reinterpretations of scripture. So because those already existed, this entire tradition already existed, that became adopted into Christianity, whether or not Paul was too worried about it or not. And so when people in these early Christian communities, the Matthewan community, the Lucan community, went to revise and write their own gospels, um, they had in the back of their minds, or in the front of their minds, uh, in both cases actually, um, the Bible, Hebrew Bible, as it had been translated into Greek, so the Hebrew, Old, the Old Testament in Greek, uh, the Septuagint, and they were especially focused on prophecies that they and many other people in Second Temple Judaism considered to be messianic. In other words, foretelling or speaking about or explaining who the Messiah is or will be. So some of the earliest texts that became the Bible, uh, including, for example, the Deuteronomic Histories, uh, those are the books Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Samuel, and Kings and Kings, those are composed just prior to the destruction of Jerusalem, so the original destruction of Jerusalem back in 587. So before that, there had been an independent kingdom of Judah, and the kings there were patrons of the authors that you know, represent sort of the source material for the Bible that's later edited after the exile's return. And that those kings came from a royal house, the house of David, that had been ruling Jerusalem pretty much since time immemorial. They had legends of their founder, David, founding it, and it, before that, uh, the Jebusites having ruled this, uh, the place. But essentially, um, David was for them an effectively a mythic ancestor uh, who is the eponymous ancestor of their house. They know that their royal house is called the house of David, and so they assume that they have an ancestor called David, and that's probably what they knew about him. So perhaps because it would have been inconceivable that the house of David would ever fall, you know, from that perspective after it had been around for these centuries, and also probably because the um, religious uh, scholars at the time, the people that were actually producing these texts, um, what we call the Deuteronomists, uh, the Deuteronomistic answer to the problem of evil, which is essentially if, um, if the reason why the nation of Judah is made to suffer is because they turn away from the worship of Yahweh and instead worship other gods, so they are polytheistic, they're pagan. Uh, but if we don't do that, we will be you know, good with God forever, and God will have us, uh, uh, will never let us down. And so as a result, maybe of all of that, uh, the Deuteron Deuteronomists write into the book of Samuel, chapter 7, a promise to David that his ancestors would reign in Jerusalem forever. I'm sorry, that his descendants would reign in Jerusalem forever. So we read there, but that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, the prophet, saying, Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. So this is an unconditional prophecy that this kingdom is never going to fall, that this royal house is going to last forever. So, unfortunately, even though that, that house had been around for all this time, um, and again, uh, while that covenant might be, have been articulated sort of towards the end of the house of David, in other words, centuries after David's effectively mythic reign, the prophecy, once it was articulated and written down into the Deuteronomic history, into the book of Samuel, it failed essentially a generation later. When the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem and took Josiah's son, Zedekiah, into exile, and so that becomes this period of what we call the Babylonian captivity when 
the nobles and uh, royal family of the kingdom of Judah are held as uh, living in the city of Babylon by the Babylonians. When Persia conquered the Babylonians and let the exiles return, the last Davidic prince, retur prince returns in the 530s or 520s, a couple generations later, in other words, but soon falls out of the story. So uh, Zerubbabel is essentially the last Davidic prince that we hear. He becomes an official, a provincial governor under the emperor, Persian emperor Cyrus the Great, uh, is sent back, and then suddenly we don't hear about him ever again. And so presumably, um, uh, presumably the Persians decide, well, this is too, too dangerous this, um, for a person from this house to continue ruling because there's too much of a chance of rebellion. And so they uh, kill him or kill, kill the Davidic kings and instead replace them with uh, uh, priestly officials who then run the province for the Persians afterwards. So um, what happens? So what happens here with the loss of a literal house of David? One where uh, prophets, uh, Nathan here in the book of Samuel, prophesied that such a thing wouldn't happen. Well, I will say that from my perspective, prophecy is often misunderstood as some kind of literal futurism where prophets are looking into the future, they're seeing what it's gonna be, they have a picture of it centuries ahead. Um, and the reason why that is problematic is if the future was actually written and that information could come back to you, time travel back to you, um, that would, I think, affect the idea of free will, whether or not we were actually making decisions and we uh, can, whether it would make any sense for prophets to uh, warn you of anything because uh, it would mean that that, has, that kind of thing had happened. So I don't believe in that kind of uh, futurism, even though some prophets think it that way. Nevertheless, prophecies do fail. Um, this one, I think, inarguably fails according to their literal reading. And when that happens, a regular practice for adherence, some adherence that says, okay, that was a false prophet. I don't believe that prophecy. I don't believe this book of scripture anymore. Um, more frequent actually though is for the adherence to reinterpret uh, the prophecy, reinterpret the text in a more spiritual sense, which they probably should have done to begin with. And this becomes common practice during the Second Temple period with the development of Messianism. So Messiah is the word, it just means anointed. It's just another way of saying king back when uh, Jerusalem had literal kings from the house of David. Now it starts to take on all kinds of cosmic and spiritual overtones uh, when there are no more literal Davidic kings as people are looking for God to impose a new kind of spiritual king, a new spiritual Messiah. So because of this, um, texts that had just been about the kings in, when they were first written um, now get reinterpreted messianically in this new spiritualized, more cosmic uh, idea of messiahs. I'm going to cough for a second here and get a... So, for example, the book of Isaiah actually assembled over several hundred years. It, its earliest parts, it begins in the 8th century BC with an actual historic prophet Isaiah. It later is added to by um, continuers who were uh, from an Isaiah uh, school who are writing in Isaiah's name and who are also editing what the original Isaiah might have written. So Isaiah chapter 7 is set in that 8th century with the prophet speaking to King Ahaz of Judah, so a king that is living in the 8th century, the end of the 8th century, but the text as we have it has been edited likely during the reign of Ahaz's great-grandson, King Josiah, in other words, at the end of the seventh century. So it's set in that earlier time period, but is probably trying to convey a message later. So let's look at what the text says. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz saying, 
Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be as deep as Shoal or as high as heaven. So if you need a sign, ask for a sign. Ahaz says, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. He knows not to walk into that trap from the prophet. But Isaiah nevertheless gives him a sign. He says, here then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary mortals that you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel. So we talked about that's the Theophoric name, an L name, which means L is with us, God is with us. He, that child, shall eat curds and honey by the time he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. Before the child knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land before whose two kings you are in dread will be deserted. The Lord will bring you and your people, and an, uh, I'm sorry, the Lord will bring on you and on your people and on your ancestral house such days as have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, the king of Assyria. So, essentially, um, these two kings that you're in dread of, these are the kings of Aram and Israel. So Aram is Damascus, it's Syria, and then Israel is this northern kingdom. Those are both more powerful than the kingdom of Judah at the time of Ahaz. So ostensibly, this message here is Isaiah is warning Ahaz of not entering into an alliance with these two kings that he fears because, in fact, that alliance is doomed to fail. Uh, the Assyrian Empire is going to destroy both Damascus and Samaria, the northern kingdom, uh, and lead away the lost ten tribes and so forth. Uh, the leading one of those tribes, Ephraim here, that's what they're talking about. So there's a kind of a prediction going on, and it's a warning against uh, alliances. It's probably a warning to Josiah that the same thing that's happened to uh, the northern kingdom will happen to you if you do something similar here. So nevertheless, um, uh, the sign here is a birth of a royal son. I'm sorry, the birth of a royal son here is simply a sign. So behold, this woman is about to have a child. Um, essentially, the point of this is the young woman, probably one of the wives or the concubines of King Ahaz, will give birth to a son, you know, maybe Hezekiah or maybe just another royal prince. But the point of it is not that that's going to happen, that that's a big deal. Um, a Middle, Middle Eastern, uh, ancient Middle Eastern king here will have had sons all the time. He has plenty of wives and concubines. Uh, so having a young woman give birth to one, that's not a big deal. The important thing here is saying all of these contemporary events, the fact that this great kingdom that you're worried about, Damascus and Samaria, Israel, that have been here all this time, those are going to be destroyed in the amount of time it takes for your baby boy to grow up and can tell right from wrong. So by the time he's weaned and is eating honey and curds and he can tell right from wrong, all of these great kingdoms are going to be destroyed. So in other words, the original text here is not about Isaiah um, looking 600 years in the future and seeing the birth of Jesus or any other Messiah in the future. Rather, it is a warning that is being given to contemporaries themselves. So this is a, a, a warning to the kings about contemporary issues. And the whole point of the kid here, the son here, is simply uh, to show the time frame. So despite the original meaning, though, so despite the fact that that's what the meaning was, this is one of many passages of the Hebrew Bible that were commonly reinterpreted by Jews of the Second Temple period to presage a coming Messiah. So this is not just a Christian interpretation at the time, um, but it is uh, just a regular messianic passage. And um, uh, there's a special twist on it, though, for Christians. So when um, uh, the original Hebrew word that was used for the young woman, the concubine or whatever of King Ahaz, um, the word in Hebrew is Alma, 
which means somebody of childbearing age, but it doesn't have anything to do uh, with virginity. So the young woman is with child and she'll bear a son and she'll call him Emmanuel. However, when that gets translated into Greek, into the Septuagint, so the Greek uh, translators use the word parthenos, which does mean virgin. And so we know that word from the Parthenon, which is the temple of Athena, the great virgin goddess. So there is this um, um, secondary meaning that gets put onto that that uh, makes, it, makes the sense of this very different. And so now the quote becomes, look, a virgin shall become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel. And so that messianic passage, as uh, altered in the Septuagint, is uh, what uh, informs a lot of the Christians and their understanding of Christ as the Messiah. And so the author of the Gospel of Matthew quotes this passage of the Septuagint explicitly, and implicitly relying on the same scripture, the author of Luke independently creates a virgin birth story for Jesus. And so uh, the angel Gabriel comes to Mary, um, who says, well, how can it be that I'm going to have a son since I've not been with any, any man? Uh, and the angel says that will, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. So this will be a, vir a virgin birth. And so there's two virgin birth stories that are unrelated uh, in Matthew and Luke. So a similar example of messianic reinterpretation of uh, a scripture from the Hebrew Bible comes from the book of Micah. So Micah is a minor prophet who was also active in the kingdom of Judah in the late 8th century BC. In chapter 5 of his book, Micah talks about a ruler coming out of Bethlehem in Judah. And so Micah says, but you, O Bethlehem of Ephrathath, who are one of the little clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, one who is to rule in Israel, whose origin is from old, from ancient days. So this is widely also, again, in Second Temple Judaism, understood as a messianic prophecy. And so once again, um, this becomes one of these very interesting independent points of minor agreement between Matthew and Luke. So in the Matthew st um, Christmas story, Herod's uh, scribes quote this passage, uh, although it's re rewritten and combined with another passage from 2 Samuel. Um, so when King Herod, uh, upon meeting the Magi, who says, we came to see where is he who was born king of the Jews, uh, Herod asks all of his scribes, what does it say in the scriptures when the Messiah is to be born? And so then they quote this scripture and say Bethlehem. So once again, the author of Luke implicitly relies on the same passage without quoting it in order to create independently an unrelated story of Jesus' birth in Bethlehem. And so um, what are these points of minor agreement that I'm talking about? So when we were talking about this two-source hypothesis for how uh, do we solve the synoptic problem, the synoptic problem is the three Gospels that are called synoptic, which means can be read together because they're so similar, Mark, Matthew, and Luke, they have literary dependence. Somebody here is using one text right in front of them as a source for their Gospel. And so um, the most common understanding for this is Matthew and Luke are both, the authors of Matthew and Luke are both creating their stories independently, but they have a copy of Mark and they have a copy of this lost sayings gospel cue in front of them, and then they are independently expanding that. But then what happens is that sometimes they also create details that aren't in Luke and that aren't in Q where they agree with each other, and then that's an argument. Well, wait a second, if that's true, then maybe there's some other solution. If those two authors are working independently, why would they have minor agreements that aren't in Mark, where they both correct Mark in the same way or change Mark in the same way and aren't found among the sayings in what the hypothetical sayings in Q, there's some other thing that's happened. Well, and so the answer, I think almost always to this um, argument is, 
that they have another source that they share, which is the Septuagint Bible. And so with the virgin birth, they both know this um, Septuagint version, version of the um, Isaiah passage about a virgin, and, and, they, and they also, with the, with the Micah um, messianic prophecy about Bethlehem, they know that. And so they therefore want to have those agreements simply because they know that from their, their main source, their main additional source, in addition to Mark and Q, the, the Septuagint Bible, which they both have access to. Um, you know, again, this uh, idea that Jesus, I'm sorry, that the Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem is widely understood. There's a point of minor agreement even with the Gospel of John, uh, because in the Gospel of John, which doesn't have a Christmas story, nevertheless, in John chapter 7, um, it talks about essentially the widespread reading of Micah as a messianic prophecy because people uh, are talking about Jesus and they're like, well, how can this guy be Jesus? Because, I'm sorry, how can this guy be the Messiah since Jesus is from a town called Nazareth in Galilee and the Messiah is supposed to be from Bethlehem in Judah? So we read then, uh, beginning in verse 41, some of the people said, this is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Messiah. But others asked, I'm sorry, but some others asked, surely the Messiah does not come from Galilee, does he? Has not the scripture said that the Messiah is descended from David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David lived? So there was a division in the crowd because of him. So um, the Gospel of John here is acknowledging uh, this is a widespread um, messianic prophecy. And it's one that the author of John here doesn't actually think applies to Jesus. The implication of the, um, uh, of the text here is that the author of John doesn't think Jesus is from Bethlehem and doesn't think he's descended from David, even though both Mark, I'm sorry, both um, Matthew and Luke have created stories that are Jesus is from Bethlehem and have created uh, lineages to say that he is a descendant of David. So, we therefore have points of minor agreement, um, multiple attestation with Luke, Matthew, and John, all three of whom understand the fact that Jesus is of Nazareth. So this guy, Jesus of Nazareth, is almost certainly from and born in Galilee, but nevertheless, all of them want him to be born in Bethlehem. So each of the, um, each of the authors here of the Gospels have their own kind of narrative ways of trying to deal with the problem. So John simply kind of dismisses the concern. He's more or less saying the crowd is confused. Sure, that some people interpreted it that way, but that's not how it's gonna be. That's not how the real Messiah is born. Luke, meanwhile, um, creates a story where Joseph and Mary, whose actual hometown is Nazareth in Galilee, nevertheless go to visit Bethlehem because uh, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all of the world should be taxed. And so Joseph and Mary went to Bethlehem to participate in the census and Jesus is born there. And there we have the story, therefore, of uh, the no room in the inn, uh, and Jesus being laid in a manger, uh, and uh, the shepherds appearing, and so forth. For Matthew, though, by contrast, Jesus and Mary are not from Nazareth. They originally live in Bethlehem, and they only flee to Egypt, and ultimately, after living uh, in Egypt, move to Nazareth, first in order to escape Herod, who... Um, massacres all of the infants that are in Bethlehem in order to try to uh, kill Jesus as a child. And then later, they, as they, when Herod the Great dies, his son is continuing to rule in Judah, and so an angel warns them that they shouldn't go back there, and they move to Galilee, which is a new place for them, unlike uh, as is described in Luke. So, um, that's essentially how we resolve, for me anyway, these uh, points of minor agreement and also get at the underlying um, historical likelihood uh, 
um, from this criterion of embarrassment and also uh, multiple attestation that Jesus is actually from Nazareth, not from Bethlehem. Um, so, since the authors of both Luke and Matthew inherit messianic interpretations of scripture, including birth narratives that are in uh, the Hebrew Bible that are interpreted as being about the Messiah, these become the source for their Christmas stories. So they lack details about the historical Jesus life, especially anything that happened before um, his baptism by uh, John the Baptist. Again, ancient people didn't record that kind of thing. That wouldn't be remembered by anyone. Nevertheless, because both of them are Christians, the authors of Matthew and Luke, and they both believe that as the Christ, as the Messiah, Jesus had lived in accordance with Scripture, then they understand that the scripture ultimately can provide the details of that story, which must, be, uh, must have been lived constantly with the Hebrew Bible. And so the Septuagint then becomes the source for the details. So, as mixed Greek convert and Jewish communities who revere Jesus the, as the Christ, so as we're seeing this development from kind of a proto-Christian movement to actual Christianity, um, these communities diverged from just being a sect of Judaism and they become their own religion. There's actually multiple Christianities, um, but the newly named Christians, um, many of them had access to these gospel writings now that included Christmas narratives, the narratives from the Matthean community and the Lucan community in the form of those two Gospels. Um, so how did they approach that and how did they now register this new idea of um, a Christmas Jesus? Uh, and so since so many of these um, Christians, converts, these first century Christians, come out of the old religions of the Greek and Roman world, what we now call paganism, um, I'm going to look a little bit at the context that they would have had for thinking about a divine infant, which wasn't, wasn't particularly alien to them. This was not something that they would have been uh, recoiling at. So there were plenty of stories of gods as infants in Greek mythology. Certainly some Greek gods come into existence fully grown. So there's a story that Athena, who is goddess of wisdom, um, actually, you know, like as Zeus has a headache and they chop his head open with an ax and Athena emerges fully grown out of his forehead. That's one example of a god that doesn't really have a childhood. Likewise, Aphrodite, the goddess of love, she uh, is audaciously formed in the sea foam out of the severed genitals of Orionus uh, after he is overthrown by uh, his son Kronos. So she's fully grown when she appears. Others do have infancy myths, um, including demigods like Heracles, but also gods like Hercules. And so, for example, uh, directly after his birth, Hermes, who is the messenger or herald of the gods, but he's also a trickster god, a god of commerce, and so on. He um, sets out, uh, according to Hesiod, to go steal the sacred cattle of Apollo, um, which he does and gets away with according to a trick, or begins to at least. He gets caught. But likewise, um, Heracles uh, and his twin, who are... Uh, essentially, again, there's a divine twin pair where one is the uh, son of the mortal woman's husband and the other is the son of a god who has had an affair with her. So Heracles is Zeus's son. Um, uh, Hera, Zeus's primary wife, is super angry about this and uh, sends snakes to kill the little babies. But Heracles, again, showing in the same way that ancient um, sources always do, his, who he is. He's going to be this guy with just crazy strength. As an infant baby, he's able to just strangle the serpents uh, to death right at birth. 
Um, I want to mention this idea of dying and rising gods. Um, in addition to baby gods, there's also this um, idea that uh, gods die and sometimes rise again. This was ex really brought to the fore and popularized uh, by James Fraser in The Golden Bough, which is a real bestseller from 1890. And it has continued to stick in the popular uh, fascination, the idea that um, there was a ubiquitous uh, idea in ancient mythology of gods that die and rise again, and that Jesus really fits very neatly into a list that includes gods like Dionysius, Iodonus, Osiris, and so on. Um, while modern scholars reject uh, Fraser's overbroad thesis, so we don't really talk about dying and rising gods as a big category like this in, anymore, there is an idea here in ancient paganism. This is a picture of uh, uh, the god Adonis, uh, the lover of Aphrodite who, who dies, and Aphrodite's there with her son Eros mourning him. Um, obviously, we talked about how um, prefiguring Christ's death and indeed resurrection is something that happens in Christmas carols, even though we're talking about the birth of the baby. Um, and so many of these include the theme that the newborn baby is going to suffer this Easter passion. And an example is the second verse of what child is this? We read there, why lies he in such mean estate, which means impoverished estate, where ox and ass are feeding, good Christian fear for sinners here, the silent word is pleading. And of course we have word, you know, there's a lot of these theological terms. Christ is the incarnate word. Nails, spears shall pierce him through. The cross be born for me, for you. Hail, hail the word made flesh, the babe, the son of Mary. So this is the, um, the passion of the Christ and the different torments are being prefigured in the song about sweet baby that's lying here. So there's the uh, foreshadowing of uh, the, the God born to die. Um, while many of the gods on you know, Fraser's list from the Golden Bough should probably not be considered, they're probably just dying gods, not rising gods, and so it's not really the same kind of thing as happening in the Jesus story. There is some interesting examples of gods who are reborn and one of these is Dionysius. So Dionysius is a god of fertility and wine um, and is sometimes considered almost like the young Jew Zeus or a Zeus reborn. Um, so the original Dionysus is understood to have died in some particular way. Possibly he's been torn apart by the Titans and his parts or part of his heart is reassembled or something and it's all kind of brought together and he's reborn again as a new, new infant. And as a result of that um, death and rebirth uh, uh, mythology or story that goes along with it, um, Dionysus also becomes associated with mystery cults in late antiquity, including the, uh, the famous mysteries, uh, Eleusinian mysteries outside of Athens, uh, mysteries that promised initiates immortality. And so that's the association that uh, Fraser drew upon with uh, Christianity and also the idea, again, of the, of the risen Christ. It's not ubiquitous. It's not like every single one of these um, uh, stories works like this, but there's a couple of them that are related because this idea is in people's minds. So it would have been a uh, in the context, not totally out of, um, context for pagans who are joining Christianity to envision this. And so like the idea of a divine infant and even a reborn God, the image of a divine mother and child would have been familiar in the context of ancient paganism. There's an image here of Isis nursing the infant Horus, <clears throat> and there are images like this of uh, Isis being a mother goddess, and the Horus, a young sun god, uh, her son, um, as being part of, you know, kind of the divine imagery and mythology. 
Likewise, um, we can probably see that the analogy of God or a God as a king of the gods with the human king that most people in antiquity who, since they mostly live in ancient monarchies, um, the analogy would be very understandable for them. The analogy here is on the one hand, the birth of a royal son that represents all the promise of a new era. Um, things are going to be very different now that we're, um, you know, uh, we would even call these eras you know, like the Victorian age. That's because of Queen Victoria. You know, there's a bunch of those that in the Elizabethan age and so on. It's less important, you know, King Charles is less important to us right now that we're probably not ever going to call this the new Caroline age or something like that. But it was important enough in the 19th century that people were still saying that. Likewise, um, in the case of a, um, a king that is born, you know, when the old king has actually died, there's a case of a, uh, a, of a capacity when the, the child or the infant actually does inherit the, the state's power, which is an interesting analogy for people to have understood in antiquity. So I want to think a little bit um, in the last phase of this of some of the Christological implications of the divine infant, God as a helpless baby, um, but still omnipotent. So as we've seen, you know, Christology, which is just a way of saying the study of Christ, sort of the technical term that we use to describe all the different ways that Christians have tried to make sense of the historical Jesus on the one hand, Jesus of Nazareth, the divine man as portrayed in the different portraits of the Gospels and the rest of Scripture. So I call that the Jesus Christ of Scripture. And then the idea that we also have in Christianity uh, that Christ is God, Christ is the Logos, that Christ is God's Word, so the Christ of theology, and how do these all relate to one another. And so before the development of the modern academic discipline of history, Christians all just largely assumed that the events in the Gospels occurred as written, and so the historical Jesus was not really part of their consideration. They assumed the Gospels uh, were historical, and we know that largely um, they're not. And so now we have that additional issue. They were more interested in how do we jive the portraits of Jesus in the Scriptures with theology, with our understanding of Christ as God. So a um, bunch of these things remained. So, even though um, most people understood, uh, who are Christian, these are Christians, most people uh, accepted and testified that Jesus was in some way divine, he's some way human, um, that isn't clear exactly what way. Um, and we've talked about, we've had several lectures about um, the amazing degree of uh, nuanced fight that uh, Christians have then for centuries and centuries on this topic. So. Christ is God, but how does Christ relate to the Father as God, and so on. So, um, in the first centuries of the, Christ, of the religion, um, Christians focused on trying to understand precisely how Jesus was a divine man. Was he born as a man and lived such a perfect life that God made him divine? Was he born divine and human in equal parts? Was he fully divine such that he only appeared to be human? So some Christians believed in each of these Christological conceptions, and it was easier to hold these before the canon developed, because once the canon is developed, it's developed by people who have one of the views, and if, it, and if, um, and if, the, if, it didn't, if the text doesn't get along with that view, it wasn't going to be put into the canon. So in general, conceptions that emphasize Jesus' humanity are kind of called low Christology, while those that emphasize Jesus' divinity are called high Christology. So if we think back to the beginning of this lecture when I was doing some of our Christmas carols, the Jesus that is talked about, the baby Jesus, in, once in David's royal city, who is described as being little and weak and helpless, and who is described as sharing both human tears and sadness, you know, that's going to be expressing a lower Christology, emphasizing the humanity of Jesus. 
By contrast, the little Lord Jesus from away in the manger, uh, no crying does he make, you know, uh, expresses a higher Christology. The idea here is that his divine um, nature is kicking in because if he's a human baby, he's going to cry. Um, and you can justify both of those, you know, uh, positions because Matthew and Luke, the place, the only place where we have talking about the baby Jesus in the scriptures, are silent about whether or not uh, any crying is happening. Um, so before we had the scriptural accounts, um, you know, when it's just people who are using the Septuagint themselves and maybe reading some of the letters of Paul. Many, perhaps most of the early Christians, believed that Jesus was probably born human, but became exalted by God, becoming God's son, either at his baptism or at his crucifixion or at his resurrection. Uh, so, for example, these Christians quoted Psalm 2-7, where the father says, You are my son, I have begotten you this day, as a way to understand Jesus becoming the divine only begotten son during his life. So that phrase is maybe assigned to Jesus when the heavens open at a Jesus baptism. The father says, you are my son, I've begotten you this day. Or when um, Jesus is on the cross, you are my son, I've begotten you this day. Or when Jesus rises on Easter, that phrase maybe is associated with that um, for those Christians who we call adoptionist, people who see Christ initially or Jesus initially as a man who becomes exalted and adopted as Jesus only begotten, I'm sorry, as the Father's only begotten. On the other end of the spectrum, as we've seen, there were Christians with very high Christologies who really emphasized Jesus' divinity. They would not have liked that uh, once in David's royal city hymn. That is totally contrary to their view about who Jesus was. Um, they sometimes essentially, they effectively uh, denied the humanity of Jesus. And so um, we call this group docetists from the Greek word that means to seem. So Jesus only seems human. And so this is the view that is favored by Gnostic Christians. Um, the idea is that there's a divine being from a spiritual realm that the mortal realm here is um, contaminating, and God's true Son um, is not contaminated by actual incarnation. He only seemed to be human as he was offering us a path back to the true um, spiritual realm. So um, while Mark has a relatively low Christology, so um, the Jesus as he appears in the Gospel of Mark um, gets kind of frustrated and angry really easily. He seems to be a lot more, the human characteristics seem to be a lot more uh, raw. Uh, by contrast, the Gospel of John has a relatively high Christology. So Jesus walks around seemingly perfectly impassive. Um, he is already omniscient, essentially. He routinely uh, gives statements where he says, I am, quoting uh, God from uh, the burning bush, and is talking about himself as the way, the truth, and the life, the resurrection, and the life, and that sort of thing. Um, between those two, Mark and John's Christology, the portraits in Matthew and Luke have a kind of a middle path, and uh, we, they take, essentially, since they're using Mark as a source, kind of the rawness of Mark's account, and instead kind of elevate it and pull it back, make Jesus less angry, more divine, but they do that without eliminating his essential humanity. And so that um, kind of allows a, an interpretation, um, again, of a Christ that is divine and human. And so that allowed for um, later arguments in later centuries um, of, you know, as, as obscure as does Christ have one nature, which is a single human divine nature or divine human nature that's combined? Or does Christ have two natures, a human nature and a divine nature? Maybe you remember, if you saw this lecture before, which one makes you a heretic? The answer was, you know, you're supposed to say two natures, <laughs> two separate natures, a human nature and a divine nature. It doesn't count. If, if you're an Oriental Orthodox, then you would say the other. 
<laughs> so, okay. So both Matthew and Luke's stories are accompanied with signs that indicate a really important divine birth, um, signs that are more significant than I think anything that I can think of comparable in uh, the birth of a prophet or a king happening in uh, the Hebrew Bible and the Old Testament, which is their um, predecessor and example. So in Matthew, that portent, you know, those signs, it's the cosmic appearance of a new star. So this is something that happens in the ancient world, which uh, equates astronomy and astrology and sees actions that are taking place in the heavens as having effects on Earth. So the fact that the moon moves around and has its courses somehow affects the tides. They don't understand why or how, but uh, it just shows to them that there is some kind of heavenly motion at a distance that's affecting Earth. Uh, and similarly, but independently, Luke has uh, divine portents uh, attending the birth of Jesus. A chorus of angels fills the heavens, announcing the birth to nearby shepherds. Each of those reflect the two um, evangelists' editorial and authorial interests. Um, Matthew goes on uh, to make topological equations. I want to explain this, what we mean by typology. So Matthew makes a big case that um, Jesus is equated with and connected with Moses. So Matthew takes Moses' birth story as told in Exodus, where at the beginning of Exodus we read that there arose a new pharaoh that knew not Joseph, and so they took the large population of uh, the kindred of Joseph of Egypt, the Hebrews, and enslaved them. And in addition to that, because they were so um, uh, populous and they were afraid that they would rebel, um, Pharaoh orders uh, the massacre of Israelite boys. And so um, that story where Moses then, uh, in the midst of this massacre of children, is put in a little basket and set on the river to save uh, uh, Nile River waters to save his life. He's found by the uh, princess in the royal house of Pharaoh and raised. Um, that becomes the antitype. And so we can think of the word archetype. In this case, when we have an archetypical thing, something that is an archetype, a truth like that, the antitype is the earlier story that prefigures the later type, which is the fulfillment of what went before. And so um, Matthew then, in his Christmas story, um, has Herod the Great when he's tricked by the Magi who do not come back and tell him where Jesus is. And so, Matt, um, so Herod doesn't know which of the children in Bethlehem are the, have been um, fated to become the king of the Jews, to overthrow his kingdom. Uh, he orders all of the children under a certain age to be massacred. So it is the same story um, repeated. And so that is showing that Christ is a fulfillment of the biblical story of Moses and that Jesus in Matthew's eyes um, is the fulfillment of, of Moses. Um, Despite uh, the many connections to Moses in Matthew's gospel, uh, for the early Christians, including Matthew, Jesus is clearly greater than Moses. And in the same exact story, Matthew has a second typological reading uh, in the flight to Egypt. So in order to escape from Herod, uh, an angel warns Joseph and Joseph and Mary and Jesus flee to Egypt uh, where they live in exile for a little while. Uh, while Herod's still alive. And so then, after Herod dies, an angel tells Joseph it's okay to come back again. Uh, and uh, now we have a typological connection between Israel, not just Moses, Israel and Christ. So after Herod's death, Joseph, Mary, and Jesus return to the land. Uh, they don't go back to Bethlehem. They don't go back to Judah because of uh, 
Uh, Herod's son is still ruling there and they think it's going to be dangerous and instead they go to Nazareth to Galilee and this is done in fulfillment of prophecy according to Matthew. So Matthew says, this was done to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, out of Egypt I have called my son. And so this phrase, out of Egypt I have called my son, is from the book of Hosea. And we read there, it says, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. The more I called them, the more they went from me. They kept sacrificing to the Baals. So um, it's very clear from the context of what Hosea is talking about. You know, it's, he's not talking about a Messiah in the future, obviously, because out of Egypt I called my son. They, he kept on worshiping to the Baals. <laughs> no, he's talking about Israel uh, was a child. Israel is God's son, the nation here, the, the entire people. Uh, and then they turn from God and worship, um, sacrifice to the Baals and so forth. So like I say, God's son in this passage is the whole people of Israel as opposed to Messiah. Therefore, the author of Matthew here is really indicating that the scripture is not to be understood literally, but typologically. Israel itself in the Exodus is the antitype to Christ, the type who is God's son. So it is both that God is called out of Egypt, Christ is fulfilling the biblical account of Israel in Exodus, uh, Matthew's Christmas story. So Israel is the antitype, Christ is the type. And I'll just mention that the, um, both the, the Exodus story, so is, um, these are not, neither one of these, should, I mean, in terms of literalism, neither of these are literal and neither of these have historicity. So the, um, the Exodus story is not a, not a historical story. There's no big massacre that happens there. The same thing, there is no massacre that happens in Matthew's story. These are me decide, meant to be meaningful typological stories, not literal historical stories. So the idea of the children of Israel as an antitype to Christ that also is going to um, fill out another Christological idea. So um, the idea is, is that in taking on the name of Christ uh, through baptism and confirmation, through making those covenants, through sharing in communion, through uh, eating the body and blood of Christ, Christians aspire to come together to become the body of Christ in the world. So in other words, Christ is um, the spiritual type to an antitype, Israel. And so now essentially the idea is, is that Christianity is the spiritual inheritor of, of Israel. So the idea though is, is that a way in which uh, human people become divine in the world uh, is that people who are acting as Christ's hands and feet in service and worship um, become Christ, the body of Christ, Christologically. So, um, as we conclude, um, I think that that Christology, um, which is more relevant to me anyway, I think finds an expression in at least one of our most contemporary carols that exists in our own church's hymnal, Community of Christ Sings, written by Shirley Irena Murray in the year 2000, No Obvious Angels. Um, so, no obvious angels sing through the night skies, no thunderstruck shepherds tell out their surprise, for Christmas comes into the here and the now through star-sighted people, the watchful and hopeful, who wake us to see a new world. Our angel potential is waiting to start, the Spirit will teach us the song of the heart. For Christmas comes into the here and the now through peacemaker people, the just and the gentle, the stars who will light the new world. Whoever will take it is given the role, the fruitful, the faithful, the joyous of soul. For Christmas comes into the here and the now when we are the angels who dream and deliver, who rise and create this new world. So 
Christians in the 21st century. I mean, I really only covered the, you know, the beginning origins to give you the background context for the development of uh, Christian Christology that, you know, as it uh, comes into contact with and then tries to understand the Christmas story in its earliest context. So Christians in the 21st century, of course, have a very different worldview uh, than our predecessors 2,000 years ago. Nevertheless, some people still continue to find new meaning in the Christmas story in completely new and relevant ways. And so that is my uh, brief take on the theology of Christmas. And while Mike is getting your questions, I'm going to go ahead and get another glass of water. Um, Philip Denoto says, Happy Festivus, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for your support, uh, Filippo, and Happy Festivus to you. Um, we will begin with the airing of the grievances, and then we will uh, proceed to the feats of strength, and we'll see what happens from there. I want to also thank everyone else who has been contributing by PayPal or directly in recent weeks. So Cecil Hawkins uh, and the, the Canter Rector Foundation to Nancy Barnett. Jason Bishop, Sean Matheson, Charles Reynolds, Robert Christopher, Craig Stoud, Timothy Cooley, uh, Nancy Modian, Galen DaCosta, Ben Hamer, my brother, thanks Ben, Anna Gold, uh, Ralph uh, Lebkuker, uh, Ariel, uh, can you increase the size of this mic? The type is really small. Ariel uh, Tejero Molino in Mexico and Victor uh, Platten in Romania. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's hit some questions. Tom Ashton says, excuse me, I'm going to cough. <coughs> Hello from Ohio, my first time here. Hi, Tom. <laughs> Is Jesus born divine? Are the supernatural events in the Bible valid? So, so the scriptural Jesus is born divine because we read it in scripture that that is uh, how it happens. The, um, the Christological Jesus is understood to be divine. Um, you know, when you say are supernatural events in the Bible valid, they are valid as sacred story. Um, are they uh, historical? Um, I would say in, in general case, you're asking about the virgin birth, we can see where the um, idea of it is even found in the, um, in the analysis that I just fairly did. So the idea of virgin birth was not known to any of the earliest um, Christians. Um, and it's ultimately, we can see where the source is. It's uh, deriving from a messianic interpretation of Isaiah as mistranslated in the Septuagint. So it is not something that um, has historicity, but we can see where they got that idea from. And now it's part of the um, now it's part of the Jesus Christ of Scripture, the sacred story for Christians, and it's part of uh, Christology often, but it is not a um, historical thing, in my opinion. Uh, Julie Brzezinski uh, says, or I'm, I'm going to keep saying that wrong, Julie, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, uh, Brzezinski. I heard Joseph Campbell, who was an expert on religion, say the virgin birth represented the birth of wisdom and love in the world. That symbology made a lot of sense to me. Do you agree? Yes. So that's, that would theologically be you know, what we're even talking about or, or Christologically, right? So the idea of it is, as we've talked about, um, prior to any Christianity, Second Temple Judaism is identifying wisdom especially as a second uh, hypostasis of God, another way of another um, person of God. Uh, so the Father, the Creator, is uh, unknowable, unseeable, but you can experience God's glory, you can experience God's wisdom. Um, the idea of the virgin birth in Scripture um, and in theology is the incarnation of love and wisdom, the birth of love and wisdom uh, in, in the world. And so I think that's great symbology. Um, 
Ricky Palacios asks, what is Christology in a nutshell? In a nutshell, it is the study of how we understand who Christ is. Uh, and so it becomes very technical because there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of underlying Greek philosophy behind it. So it's frankly um, argued in the first centuries and actually since then um, using you know, Aristotelian categories of logic and things like that. And so that's why you know, even when I was talking about um, how do we identify uh, the difference between God the creator and wisdom, and I had to immediately kind of revert to a word, let word like you know hypostasis, <laughs> hypostasis, you know, which is to say an early Greek um, Aristotelian kind of category of understanding. So Christology gets complicated, but it's more or less uh, the study of how do we understand Christ or who Christ is, what Christ is in uh, Christianity. Sandra Byrne asks, "Are you familiar with Alfred Burt Carroll's?" Um, you would especially appreciate um, some children see him. Yeah, I know that song. You know, I used to, I sang that song. The last time I sang that song, some children see him, Lily White or something like that. I was I remembering. Um, I haven't sang that since I was in the Minnesota Boy Choir back in 1982, <laughs> but I, I remember that song. So that's really nice. Um, thank you. Um, I'll have to look it up when I get home. Uh, videos for stuff said. Um, it never made sense to me how we refer to the future coming of Jesus as the second Je coming when Jesus already came once when he was born in Bethlehem and he already uh, came too when he came back in the cave. And I'm not sure if you mean by back in the cave, you're talking about um, when he comes back in Pentecost and so forth, when he comes back and talks to all of the, uh, the risen Christ, comes back and talks to all of the apostles and everything like that. So. So there's a lot of confusion about um, Jesus' second coming uh, because of that, because there was an idea that um, the, the confusion happens because when these first stories about uh, the risen Christ appearing among uh, the apostles in the first century and things like that, uh, all of them and uh, Paul assumed that that was the second coming, he's already come, and that the whole rest of the end of the world was about to happen. But we've subsequently learned that the whole rest of the end of the world wasn't going to happen. Their ideas about a world-ending event were wrong. And so that has left confusion because there's a lot of uh, Christians who still think that there is now a long-delayed world-ending event where all the whole physical world will be destroyed and there'll be a new world that comes into being in some kind of a, a historical act that changes all of the universe and destroys everything. Um, and so as a result, they, there has to be two second comings, the one that already happened and this long expected one. Um, but so that's, I think, why the, um, the phrase doesn't um, have a lot of meaning. So I prefer to think of the second coming as already happened and now, um, now what we're trying to do is achieve um, uh, uh, God's heaven on earth, and that is something that's slowly, hopefully slowly happening, although often we see signs that there's actually regress and we're going the wrong direction. Okay, so um, objective ethics and also Sphinx 4 are, and Anita Coleman are talking, so well, let's go ahead and uh, see what some of these are in the discussion you guys were having. Objective ex Ethics wrote, I have been doing a lot of research into the Q hypothesis and it doesn't actually seem to hold up that Q ever existed. Q is entirely unnecessary. It is perfectly reasonable that Luke simply used Matthew and redacted his unique ideas not gathered from Mark. So that's another theory, um, Objective Ethics, and I don't, um, I don't agree with that reading. I don't think that that's the easiest thing. I think that that requires uh, Luke to do all kinds of crazy stuff um, that I think is not not likely. Um, Sphinx asks, in response to that, if Luke knew Matthew, why did he completely reject great story material like the adoration of the Magi, the flight to Egypt? Uh, why provide a completely different genealogy from Matthew? Those are good responses. Um, um, Objective Ethics says Christianity was heavily influenced by Zoroastrianism, so 
Matthew included the Magi as a way to imply that uh, the story followers of Rehur Maser were now acknowledging the Jewish Messiah, sure, but that wouldn't cause Matthew to delete the story of the Annunciation, the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth, all of that stuff. Matthew hates delete, or you're saying, it's the other way around, you're having Luke delete. Um, so, so I'm not sure what that point was. <laughs> so the point is, so the question is, would, why would, um, you're saying that Luke is the one that's deleting, so why would Luke delete? Okay, you're saying the skew hypothesis is developed in response to the mythicist argument to make it seem like there were more independent sources. Now that's not the case. <laughs> So it's not, a, it's, not that there, the, it's not to make it seem like there's more. The mythicist argument is not, um, no one's arguing in response to that. It's not an argument that's taken seriously by almost any biblical scholars. Um, um, that's not where Luke is coming from. The problem with your redaction theory is that Luke is deleting all of those stories in order to create entirely new ones um, in this case. So anyway, let's... Uh, this is going to keep on going on and on and on, I guess, between, between the two of you. I appreciate the, those. I'm, going to, I'm coming out on the side of um, Sphinx 4 <laughs> so on, on this, because I really do think that the uh, two-source hypothesis is the most reasonable one. I think that it requires um, a Luke redaction of Matthew requires uh, too many. I, I think it's too easy to answer the um, uh, the minor detail agreements and overlap. In other words, the, the things that don't come out of Matthew and Q, uh, and instead um, try to figure out all of the reasons why um, Luke would so heavily take the Matthew and material and really hate the Matthew and material, which we did, totally deletes. Um, Anita Coleman asks, uh, didn't Mithraism come before uh, Zoroastrianism and the Mithraism was one that caused the problem in early Christianity, i.e. before 300 in Constantine. So Zoroastrianism is first. So Mithra is a god, and there was a god Mithras um, in, uh, you know, just as a regular paganism that exists. But Mithraism, when you're thinking about it, is a, is a mystery religion that is largely non-Babylonian. It's largely just a Western mystery religion. Uh, in Christianity, and that comes long after Zoroastrianism. Zoroastrianism has a major influence um, on Judaism and therefore Christianity. Uh, Mithraism is a contemporary of Christianity, um, which um, of early Christianity, which some people have seen it as uh, as, simil as having similarities, but there's actually um, a lot of these are again 19th century um, parallelisms. Uh, that are not, you know, that aren't very sound now. Ron Wagner asks, what Greek word should have been used for young woman instead of virgin? So I don't know Greek, so I can't tell you that. Um, I'm, my background is Latin, and so I always say, Greiki es non legator, it's all Greek to me. We would have to look it up. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the translators used that, that word, Parthenos, um, which gave it that extra spin that became important, more important as a messianic um, miracle, ultimately. Donnie Ling Gringo from Brazil writes, uh, does John have an opinion on why there never were any eyewitness gospels in any parts of the life of Jesus? And could, well, first answer, because they, Jesus and his followers were poor, humble people. So there's no eyewitness uh, gospel accounts written because you have to be rich in order to write stuff down. And so um, when we're going back to the actual historical Jesus and the Jesus movement, this is coming out of um, uh, what is effectively peasantry. Uh, and so these are not um, people who have uh, the leisure, the money, the education to, to write this stuff down. So that's uh, why I would say there's no eyewitness gospel accounts. And you ask, could Q source have been one of those eyewitness gospels? No. So Q has been extensively uh, studied, and it is, again, written in Greek to begin with. So it is closer, probably, to anything than else we have. Um, and it does seem to have a potentially even rural Galilean perspective 
um, relatively rural, but is nevertheless has already made its way out of Jesus's native language of Aramaic and into um, somebody with some scribal skill who is writing in Greek. And so we, um, there's a vibrant Jesus movement that exists before anybody starts writing it down. And so when this starts getting written down in the richer Greek speaking world, um, it's preserving some of those details, but it's also unfortunately not preserving all the details. Um, Donnie Lee Gringo also asks, how do we use the baby Jesus story with all of its attached theology for people who like me view Jesus as a great teacher and model, but not born as the son of God or as a savior. So I would say that if you have that feeling already, uh, Donnie Lee Gringo, then you should start to do the thing that I've already been doing in this all the time, which is detach, 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 detach your um, view of the Jesus of scripture, your theological understanding of Christ, um, from any idea of historicity. So do not focus on, yes, you know, so Jesus, there was a historical Jesus. This is not what we have when we are reading about, when we're reading the sacred story of Jesus Christ in the gospel accounts, which are, have some uh, little handfuls of memories of who the historical Jesus was. And indeed, the historical Jesus, like you're saying, was a great teacher. So some of his teachings are preserved and some of what Jesus did maybe be as a model, but actually almost all of the narrative is, is, um, is from the scripture, Jesus of scripture, not the historical Jesus. So once you have that, you understand that the baby Jesus story, all scholars agree that there's no historicity to the baby Jesus story. There is a historical Jesus, but these stories are the literary creations of the evangelists or their communities. So the Lucan community and the Matthean community and so those are telling a theological story. You understand it, uh, the Matthean story, just like I taught it just now, typologically. Um, what Matthew is saying is that, um, not literally, but meaningfully, typologically, Jesus is Moses. Moses also wasn't a historical figure. Moses is a myth. Uh, likewise, the new Israel, our spiritual community, we can be Christ in the world. We are the new spiritual Israel. Um, it's a typology for the Exodus story, which is likewise a myth. The history is not what's relevant here. The meaning is what's relevant. And so that's how I would make use of it. Kerman Wingfield asks, um, a very important part of Christmas is the tree. Can you cover its pagan origins in Jeremiah? So, so the Christmas tree's history is um, a little bit divisive in terms of uh, the pagan, whether it's paganness or not. So the, the Christmas tree itself seems to be a pretty recent, um, I think it's a pretty recent practice um, as opposed to something that has like continuity all the way back where we're seeing like Christians in the Roman Empire or something like that in the fifth century with trees like this. That said, trees have, um, long-standing spiritual connections that go back to the old religions. So a tree is something that has a longer lifespan in some cases than humans. And so as a result, um, humans see them as temporal continuity between an earlier generation and the future. And they are also taller than humans and really strong. And so people see them when they have a, um, a cosmological worldview where they're thinking of an underworld and they're also thinking of uh, heavens and they're thinking of gods in an underworld and gods in heavens. A tree is a bridge because it has roots that go down into the underworld and into the high heavens. And so, so there are all sorts of um, pagan and other um, uh, old gods associations, animistic associations with trees. Um, um, but you know, it doesn't mean that necessarily the Christmas tree is an actual um, hangover of any of that in particular, although you can, people, some people made an argument that maybe it is. Um, but I don't think it's necessary. What we can kind of say is that um, uh, trees are now a symbol and they have these important symbols, you know, like they, like they always have had, that are, whether or not they're pagan or Christian or however you want to call it, secular for the most part. Most people who have Christmas trees are not, 
um, not actively religious anymore, I would say. Um, Philip Denoto, thank you for your support. Um, which came first, Christmas or Easter? <laughs> um, Easter. <laughs> so in terms of anybody being aware of it or anybody uh, celebrating it, by far, Easter comes first. And Easter is um, ultimately way more important uh, in, you know, like the early Christian religion, and it should be still the most important um, Christian holiday. Um, Christmas is a prefiguring of, of Easter. Easter is also um, probably attached to the right time of year, whereas um, we don't really know when Christmas should be. So a lot of times people, I mean, I've said before sometimes that Jesus is not born on Christmas Day. Well, Jesus is born on Christmas Day by definition, because that's what the word Christmas means. <laughs> but uh, we don't actually know when Christmas is supposed to be. So in other words, we have no idea when Jesus' birthday is. It's arbitrary uh, in, um, in the fourth century that they, or actually even maybe even later than that, that, um, that the Christmas celebration gets uh, attached to December 25th. Um, but yeah, Easter was always the more important, and that's also the earlier celebration for Christians. Daryl Scott, thank you for your support. Um, you asked, can I go into a more detail on the idea of Christ's being, birth being with us in the present, and is this a widespread theological idea? So, I, I think it is. It is certainly a, a theological idea or a Christological idea that I am really focused on right now. And so as I have kind of um, attempted to, you know, as I, I've done different studies. So initially when um, I got interested in theology, I was pretty focused on God the source, God um, the unknowable, unseeable, the creator, God the father, God the parent. Um, and I was like, eh, what is, I wasn't as, I wasn't as connected to Christ. Um, but as I have tried to myself study um, Christology and also have a more personal connection to that component of my religion, I have gotten really interested in and um, positive about this idea of um, Christ fully human and fully divine, Christ being this bridge that is connecting us in the world, you know, the, the problem with the, um, the source, God the Father, is God is un, unknowable and remote. This is much more tangible as we are aspiring to be um, the hands and, and body of Christ in the world, and there is an understanding, at least aspirationally, of the sacred community of attempting to live that out, as that being the goal. Um, and so one of the things that um, in my church this year, we are going to emphasize here at Toronto Center Place with the sacred story, with, for some people here, Christian mythology, with the, the scriptures, the Jesus of scripture, is we're going to attempt to not use the past tense. So we're going to attempt to talk about all of these stories in the present tense, that this is happening, you know, Christ is born today, not Christ was born 2,000 years ago or something like that, um, is going to be the kind of the refrain, which sometimes happens in the, you know, so you ask how widespread is it? You know, when we're saying Christ is born today, Christ is born today, that's the present tense. That exists in a bunch of the different hymns where the present tense is used. Um, but I think lots of people mentally reframe that and try to put that into a thing as if we're talking about the past. I want to um, get past this focus on historicity um, and instead be uh, experiencing sacred story in the present. So we'll see. That's what I'm working on. So Jared, uh, thank you for your support. Um, what does it mean, I'm sorry, what does the gold hold other than um, being uh, just given to the baby Jesus? So we were talking about, so yeah, we're talking about gold and frankincense and myrrh, and like you were saying, frankincense is burned in the synagogue, so it's actually burned in the temples, not maybe in the synagogue too, but it's, you know, essentially frankincense is needed because they're sacrificing animals and there's a horrible smell uh, when that butchery is happening. And so they're using all kinds of uh, incense in the temples in order to um, cleanse that. Uh, they didn't have uh, 
other ways of cleansing smell back then and odor. So frankincense is about that. And like you say, myrrh, we've already talked about, prefiguring, going to die. So what is gold um, meaning? So it's probably, well, everybody likes gold. <laughs> you know, it's always a good present. No, but I think that um, the idea is it's a, um, uh, it's a regal gift. So the king, or the wise men here, the magi are saying, um, where is he who is born king of the Jews? So the gold is saying he's a king. Um, the myrrh is saying that he's a sacrifice. And uh, frankincense is saying you know, that he's God. So king and God and sacrifice is what the, the way the three kings, uh, we three kings phrases it. And I think that that's a, a, a solid interpretation of that. Uh, Captain Hardluck asks, um, so Mormons believe Elohim hooked up with Mary to make Jesus. So that is something that Brigham Young taught. I don't know that all Mormons believe that. There's some Utah Mormons maybe who believe that, that I don't think that made it into um, official Mormon doctrine. I think that's a teaching of Brigham Young and a lot of Brigham Young's teachings of that kind are discredited. But anyway, you can ask, other, you can ask people in the Utah Mormon church if they believe that. Um, that is not... Um, that is not the view in community of Christ, <laughs> just, to be, just to be clear. Um, a lot of Zeus, he's saying there's a lot of Zeus mating with mortals. Do you think Joseph Smith got the idea from the Greeks? I don't, did Joseph Smith, I don't know that Joseph Smith actually said that. I think it's a Brigham Young teaching. Um, so I'm thinking, did, Joseph, did Brigham Young get the idea from the Greeks? Brigham Young is promoting, so, so by that time, that Brigham Young is teaching that, or if Joseph Smith is teaching this at the end. This is Joseph Smith's um, um, progression theology, where he is saying that uh, essentially God is, was once a human being, and human beings can become gods, and it's all intertwined with polygamy. And so the, um, uh, so the, the theological idea of this, uh, the polemical idea of this that Brigham Young is having is, um, you know, he wants to have Jesus be a polygamist. And so it's not just Mary Magdalene, who's his wife, which by the way, Mary Magdalene is not Jesus's wife, but all of the other Marys and everybody else, Martha and everybody, they're all Jesus's plural wives, according to Brigham Young, in order to, to argue about polygamy. And same thing, um, uh, God is a polygamist. So Brigham Young is teaching that Adam is God, and so Eve is one of his wives, and Mary is one of his wives. And so it's, it's this uh, polygamy business, which like I say, we reject. Does he, Joseph Smith get it from the Greeks? I think he's getting it from um, practicing polygamy. <coughs> so Anita Coleman asks, um, have John talk about Mithraism and early Christianity uh, having a very close call run into the finish and we're neck and neck and which would win out? Is that true? So I've given a lecture, Anita, just a few months ago called... Um, um, uh, mystery religions, and I talk about Mithraism a lot in there. Um, I don't think that I, I don't think it's a close call and neck and neck. Um, but the but since Christianity wins because they convert an emperor, um, it that could have happened, you know, that could have happened with Mithraism. And so it's not it's not about being neck and neck because it's not like Christians had had started to convert forty percent, fifty percent of the Roman Empire or something like that, and Mithraism had done twenty percent. They both were important minority religions, Christianity being a bigger one, um, Mithraism maybe being a little bit, maybe it's pretty rich in some of its, uh, might have been a little richer, maybe a little less persecuted. Um, and so if an emperor had, had become a Mithras, Mithraite or whatever, Mithras worshiper, then, then that possibly could have um, become the state religion of the Roman Empire. Um, so it, it's really, the, the, the winning is really about who, uh, who converted an emperor? Um, Anita also, oh, I'm sorry. Um, videos for Stuff uh, says, I sometimes hear that frankincense and myrrh would have been as valuable or more valuable than gold at the time. Is there any historicity to that? I, you know, so, you know, in terms of being worth your weight in gold, um, I'm not sure <laughs> how, you know, so frankincense is pretty rare, but they have to burn an awful lot of it in these temples. They also have a lot of gold. 
So I'm, I'm not an uh, uh, economic historian on that kind of thing, so you'd have to look it up in terms of that. There's, uh, there's certainly all valuable, but the point of it is symbolic, right? So the whole issue here is there's no, there's no real magic. This is, a, this is a symbolic story, and the story has a symbolic meaning. It's not, um, they're not, there's not actually any gold and frankincense and myrrh involved in history here. It's not historical. Uh, Anita Coleman also asks, am I correct that John would not be upset if everyone didn't 100% agree with him. I, I, get, I get the feeling he would prefer if we uh, think and think on it. Of course, you're not supposed to, um, certainly don't have to agree with me. And in fact, especially not on everything. I have all kinds of things where I have a very particular take. I am a kind of a historical minimist, minimalist. And so my, um, I generally want to hew pretty close to the sources. And that's why we spend a lot of time in these lectures where I'm just reading primary sources to you. And so we, I, try, I try not to get too far um, away from those at any time. Um, but uh, yeah, when I, when I do, so sometimes, um, certainly like I presented here, even though um, by far and away the majority of uh, biblical scholars um, are in favor of the two source hypothesis, this is nevertheless a hypothesis I, you don't have to agree with me. There are, other, there are a bunch of people still who um, believe in a Matthew in priority, even. There's not a bunch, but some scholars, and, and you can argue that. And so that is a, um, that's you know, another possibility there. And, and uh, I, obviously, I was arguing with one of our uh, objective ethics, one of the, you know, one of the followers here, and he's per, he or she are perfectly willing to, are perfectly able to have their own opinions and do their own study and come to their own conclusions. Uh, final comment, Kyle Johnson says, I no longer practice religion, but I'm super into religious history and comparative religion, and these lectures are freaking awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Center Place. Well, that is a wonderful um, uh, testimonial here at the end of our year, and so I will wish all of you who celebrate it a very Merry Christmas and otherwise a happy holidays and a happy new year to everyone else who no longer practices or maybe doesn't practice that one. A lot of people practice Christmas even so because it's secular. <laughs> anyway, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, Happy Holidays.